You're live. You're live. You can go ahead. Start. Okay, so uh, it's uh, 11 o'clock. Dibya, move to the center. Move to the center. Dibya is not in the camera. Yeah, yeah. Too many things. Go, go on stage. Go on stage. We're, yeah, can, can you see me now? Yep, perfect. Okay. So, uh, welcome you all for another Giant Voice session. Uh, those of you who know what the event is, you know that we uh, meet on first and third, and if there is any fifth Sunday, we form a TIFR. Scientists, PhD students, they give talks on uh, their research topic, but in a way. So today, uh, uh, Arnav, uh, uh, sorry, speak loudly. I, okay. Okay. So today, uh, Arnav has given me the opportunity to introduce speaker and all because Arnav is busy. Arnav went somewhere and just returned uh, today morning. Uh, so I am Divya Shankar Das. I am a PhD student at TIFR. And um, so today, this 20th August, this actually, uh, um, you know, it's an uh, excellent way to, uh, excellent day to have Chain Wai because uh, many of you probably know today is the martyrdom day of uh, Dr. Narendra Dazalkar. And today we celebrate uh, in India uh, this day as National Scientific Temper Day. So, you know, the, the main one of the main goal of China is obviously create uh, scientific temper and all. So it's a great day to have our China here. Uh, so uh, today Satanu, uh, my senior uh, for my department, he will give the talk. Uh, and the next uh, next to next Sunday, the first uh, Sunday uh, of September, uh, Arno will actually give a talk in Prithvi Theater. Uh, that is in re reinventing will. Okay, so those who can, we uh, invite you there also. So about Satan, Satanu is as I, we joined TIFR on the same batch, but uh, he is my senior. So he has recently submitted, uh, given his synopsis, yet to submit his thesis. So he works on uh, friction and all. Uh, he will speak about that. So he did his uh, undergrad from Presidency College, Kolkata, and then master's in IIT Bombay. And for the last six years, he's here doing his PhD. So over to you, Satanu. And uh, I have prepared this joke uh, that, uh, you know, though his, the title of his talk is Friction in Action, but we hope that he, his talk will go smoothly. Hey. We can oh, yeah. Where is the pointer? Ah, there it is. Share the screen. Yeah, we have shared this. Once you're ready, just tell me. Okay. Hello, all. And I'm going to speak on. Oh, sorry. Ah. Hello, and welcome to my presentation. So, I'm going to talk about friction. Now, I've tried to keep this talk as informal as possible. There will be no equations. Whatever I need to show you, I should be able to do a demo of. And if you feel, if you have any questions, stop, stop and ask me. So this is the brief outline of our talk. We'll first discuss what we understand as fiction, as you know, in our daily lives. Then we'll go over some of the history, like how it developed as a science, how people understood it better. And then we'll talk about, you know, some examples we see in our daily lives. Once that ends, since I am part of a research institute and I do work in this topic, I have the opportunity to present to you some work done in our laboratory. And I'll talk about two experiments. Once that is done, hopefully you will have learned something. We can have some chai. And after the chai, we can play around with some of the demos. So, okay. Since I'm giving a talk on friction, I think the first question you should ask me is like, what is friction? Like, what are you going to talk about? Rather than me answering this question, let's start from the audience. What do you think friction is? Okay. So your understanding of friction is drag, like it opposes motion. 
this you understand because when you're driving a car uh, please repeat the audience questions if possible forward. please repeat that's the audience answers so please. that is one we part can't hear the audience so please repeat the answers one thing that uh, you know we cannot hear audiences uh, answer any question they're answering ha ah, that's right ah, i see i see okay so one part of friction we understand is friction is drag some kind of resistance but is that all that it is first of all you use friction not only as a resistance but in very different Ways, like one example is this watch I am wearing. Now, just to point out to you, how does the belt work? The belt works by friction, by grabbing onto my skin. How am I tightening this belt? I am tightening the belt by making it shorter. What's happening when I am tightening it? It's putting a force on my skin, but look at the direction in which it's putting the force. It's putting the force into my body. but is resisting the motion in this direction so friction is generated when you have you know loads or normal forces acting on a surface and the force of friction is always going to oppose your motion now it is this concept that allows you to grip things because even when i am gripping this pointer look at where my fingers are this is normal to the surface normal to the surface of the pointer i am holding pinching it to hold it and the tighter i pinch the better the grip is so friction is a force that opposes motion it also allows you to grip this is why often friction is described as you know a necessary evil without it you could not grip on to anything but it is always a leads to a loss in energy and how is the energy loss you know that when two surfaces rub against each other they wear out they get uh, worn down and it generates heat now we find that that these observations that we have now they are not really anything new we know this from the stone ages we know how to start a fire using dry pieces of wood we know that when we rub these pieces together they will generate heat and this heat is enough to burn the small particles of wood there is and start a fire in addition in stone age tools we started using rope this is to tightly bind one object to another these are Contact, and the rope is doing the same thing. My belt is doing; it's holding it tightly to one surface to another by normal force. So humans have started to understand that there is some kind of interaction at the surface level from many years ago. But these are observations; they are not systematic in any way. For that, we come to the earliest, like this period, somewhere around the zero A.D. we have philosophers who are now observing nature and making their observation and trying to understand why aristotle figured out that you know the rounder the surface is the less it's likely to drag it rolls more easily it travels more easily so the spherical objects tend to drag less lucretius figured out that if your surface is rough it no matter if it's round or whatever shape if the surface is rough it's going to drag more pliny In, again in rome he made a list of lubricants because at that in addition to being an empire that had a very strong army the Ro roman empire had lots of engineers and also it was an agricultural colon agricultural civilization they had to deal with so much wheat and they had mills and so they needed to figure out how to keep care of their mills how to keep the mills running so they made a list of you know lubricants this works best this does not work this works on this material so pliny did that again these are observations but these are better observations more your their people are starting to come to the crux of the matter but there are no numbers nothing says that this is a better lubricant than this by this much only that this is a better lubricant that is a worse lubricant or this is a better rolling surface that is a less rolling surface things like that we need numbers or else we can't call it a science who do you think worked out the numbers first and in which year okay first which year when did we start getting numbers no no not lubricant like friction you want to put numbers on it like to measure friction 1600 or 1700 huh so you you are going in newton so the audience one member of the audience is saying that it must be newton around the 1700 any other guesses 
Another case is 1795 when the metric system came out. Both of you are slightly off. Well, the human history is very long. 200 years is nothing. The first experiments were done by Leonardo da Vinci. And he made his observations in his own notebooks. And he, in his past time, tried to figure out, like, how is the force of friction working? How do I put numbers on it? And if you, uh, can I please see that? If you look at these two experiments, you'll realize that these are the same type of experiments we still do today to measure friction. What Leonardo found out was that if you have a weight of some kind and you're pulling it over a pulley by another weight, you need to apply some level of weight before you know it starts to slip. So he called this resistance and he measured this resistance. He found out some properties which we still know today that it does not matter what kind of shape the object has. As long as the weight is the same, the frictional resistance will be the same. And this is why he also drew this figure. He showed that I can take five blocks, move, line them up like this, or line them up like this. I'll need the same force to move them. So he figured out that my frictional force is proportional to the weight of my objects, which is acting downwards on the surface. Unfortunately, Leonardo never published anything. These were his observations. He kept in his private notebooks and he never shared them with anybody. Hence, it took a long time for people to work out friction again, which was done. What happened? Aha, uh -huh, you had clicked out there. Ah, so, and in addition, he was not content with just understanding friction. He wanted to see if he could design anything based on what he learned. He came up with the design of a ball bearing, which is used today. Not his design, but he designed one. And this is a model that is built following his design, which is why you can, you, some of you may have heard of, you know, Leonardo's tank or Leonardo's driving vehicle, where he put in designs like this, small designs. So he said that if you put this, it will be less loss, it will be easier to move, things like that. But he never shared his results. So we come to 1700s and the 1800s. Two French engineer, French people, it had to rework friction details out again. So the first was Amontas, who worked out the two most important observations that it is proportional to the normal load that you put, it is proportional to the weight on the surface. The AD of contact does not matter. And he believed that friction is due to the roughness of the surface itself. No surface is exactly smooth. They are all rough to a certain degree. It is because these roughnesses are there. They can't move smoothly. This is creating friction. Much later, Coulomb, the same Coulomb who gave us Coulomb's forces uh, in electricity, he worked out that no, it is not weight. Any kind of compressive force on the surface will lead to friction which is what is doing here. This belt does not weigh anything. It's its tightness that is holding to my skin. So Coulomb figured that out. And this is the more or less what you will learn at high school. And it's pretty accurate. However, there is one problem. Like there are experiments or there are observations that you make where you know something goes down to you. For it, like, is it really not dependent on the area of the surface you're working with? What if the surface is sticky? Is that not friction? So what happened? So much later, in the 1950s, these two scientists, Borden and Tabor, they figured out that no, it is true that the surfaces are rough, and this, but these roughnesses are extremely small. And because they're so small, they are very easy to wear out or plastically deform. Plastic deformation, so if you have a spring and you pull on it, it will try to come back to its own length. This is called elastic deformation. Whatever energy you're putting in to extend it, the same energy it will try to release and come back. A plastic deformation is when you extend it and it cannot come back, which is what you have seen as when you try to tear plastic or pull plastic, that it becomes thinner, but it cannot come back to its original shape. So there is plastic deformation. They argue that this is the same thing happening at the surface level. There are small, changes in roughness, 
and because of this small changes are so plastic when two surfaces rub against each other they will plastically deform it is this deformation that is leading to a drag now this allows you to add also that if the surface is sticky it will also add up to friction like there is a, a force that is going to deforming the surface and the force that is associated how sticky the surface is now i have given you a basic understanding of friction and its details that yeah the force of friction is directly proportional to the normal load on on the surface it does not depend on the area in most cases because the area of true contact of area is very small and it's only tiny areas which are coming into contact is the deformation of the surfaces which are leading to friction and uh, different materials have different roughnesses and we measure it by seeing that how much force i would need need to make it slip so this is the information i can provide you and all this information is on the net but you have come for some demos and you know some hands on experience so let's go with that so the first question is okay how do i measure friction so let's do one demo and if time permits we'll do more uh yeah stop the screen share yeah i'm doing that and if you if you want to ask me any questions go ahead I'm not blocking anyone, right? Hmm. Let me set it up. It's open. Oh, not good. ये इससे लग रही है ना जस्ट एक्सटेंड द मॉडल हम्म पानी इसमें डालेंगे सो हां ओके आई विल टेल यू व्हाट द डेमो इज सो व्हाट वी आर ट्राइंग टू मेजर इज द हाउ फ्रिक्शन वेरीज विद वेट सो friction is proportional to the amount of forces i'm putting on the surface and easiest way to do that is you know take some known weight and put it on a surface because its weight will act downward onto straight down so my normal force is whatever weight of that thing is now not all of it will go to friction only a certain amount that small amp, that proportionality is called mu or the coefficient of friction which is dependent on the surface you are working with and uh, surface says you are working with two surfaces in contact and what what we are we expecting that once we have loaded it enough and friction can no longer oppose hold up this weight it will start to slide so friction can only be up to a certain amount and we are going to find its breaking point that is the logic of our experiment now the demo is ready so here i have a block of wood actually do this second check to open this or if this ah i got it i got it hey what are so as you can see here i uh, can you see uh, can you see what i'm doing i have a block of wood and it's being dragged down by this water bottle i am going to slowly pour water in this bottle until it slips so
Right? <laughs> well, that was one thing that happens often when you're doing an experiment. You have to be always ready. Luckily for me, my co-presenter was. So this slip, when I put at least this much water into it, so all I need to measure the force of friction is measure the weight of the bottle and the weight of the wood and the ratio of them is my friction coefficient. But to keep in mind, this is the coefficient of friction for a static case. How much force you need to make a to make something slip? There are other form coefficients of friction. Any one of you who has moved furniture throughout the house, you know that it's very difficult to get it started. But once you have pushed it and it slides, it's easier to keep going. So what happened? What's happening is you're going. You're at first dealing with the static coefficient of friction, which is some ratio. But once you're moving, you're dealing with the dynamic coefficient of friction, which has a lower value. And we use this every day. That is much easier to keep a thing sliding. Then once it's moving, then when it's stationary. So why did it take so much water to move this wood? If you can see closely, the wood was resting on a sandpaper surface. Sandpaper is extremely rough, and it is the roughness of this surface which is making it difficult for the wood to move. If I remove this sandpaper surface, and, and did the experiment again, Right? You're actually blocking the microphone. Ready? No. A lot less. Which is so the roughness of the surface affects how much friction there is. The opposite is also true. If you can make it a very smooth surface, the friction coefficient will again go down. So here, one side of the wood has been prepared with sun mica, and sun mica is this is also sun mica. So it's a smooth surface and a smooth surface, which is going to reduce friction even more. Okay, next slide. Actually, can you keep it here? Then I don't need to walk over there. Right. Oh, I did. Sorry. Ah. So this is the first part. This is how you measure friction. But is that the only kind? Here we talk. So what you are observing there is sliding friction. And you know that more than sliding, it's much easier if you have a wheel or something spherical to roll on. The reason is that once you're sliding, there's a lot more area of contact, means more deformations to come over, overcome. And this is why there's more drag. But when you have only one point of contact, which is continuously slipping, this is going to give you on average much lesser drag, which is why, you know, car wheels are round. And Arno will tell you more in the next talk. But given that you are starting with some surfaces, can you reduce friction even further? The answer is yes. You use lubricants. Now, lubricants can be of two kinds. You can have wet lubricants like oil. What it does is it creates a thin film so that this roughness of the two surfaces do not come into contact. On the other hand, you can also have dry lubricants, which in how many of you have played Caram? So before playing carom, you prepare the board with some kind of powder to, so that you know your disc moves more easily. So that is a dry lubricant. Its idea is that it will create layers and layers of dry of the substance, and these layers will easily come off each other. And this creates the lubricating effect. 
So you have dry lubricants and wet lubricants and both reduce friction. On the other hand, you can also convert the sliding friction to a rolling friction by the use of bearing. Here you have balls which are stuck in place and you have two rings, the outer and the inner one. So if the inner one rotates, it is going to rotate on the ball. And so the frictional uh, drag that it feels is much less because it's rolling friction. But I have talked about, you know, smooth surfaces reduce friction. One question you can ask me is how smooth? The now there's this answer. So I can keep making the surface smooth. I can give you glass. I can give you even a lubricated surface. But there is one caveat. There must be some roughness present. If this surface is smooth on the atomic scale, more complicated phenomena will start to pop up. One of which is this video. If you ever have the time, please go and watch it. It's Veritasium's video on Van der Waals forces. And what is what is happening is that any Atomic surface is composed of atoms. If it's perfectly smooth and all the atoms are close to each other, what happens is the charge of one atom is going to affect the charges present on the other. This is, and charges are going to separate. Positive charges will go to one side, negative charges will go to one side. The surfaces are neutral, but there is going to be slight variation in charges. Now, every two atoms will pull each other because of this charge separation. Because they're so close, even though the force, uh, the charge is very small, there's going to be a lot of force. And if you have a very smooth surface that extends over many atoms, these forces are going to add up. This is an extremely strong force. Like here, this shape does not have any glue on it. It is just at this level, a, atomic, a very smooth surface. A thin tape like this is able to pick up a 300 gram tomato. So Van der Waals forces are extremely strong, but they work on an extremely small length scale, which is why you can, if you want, you can get rid of friction making a surface smooth, but if you make it too smooth, you'll run into other problems. Now, let us go through some questions. Now, what happens? Yes, go ahead. Is there Okay, you want to prepare? Go ahead. Okay, I'll wait. So, I have been talking to you about, you know, two surfaces. Two, you know, big surfaces. What if you are working with, you know, small objects? Collection of small objects. This brings us to the regime of granular system or grains. Now, a sand pile is something you have seen often. Here, the grain, the sand pile can maintain some angle. This is because there is friction between the grain. Because of this friction, this sand pile is stable. If this was water, this would just flow down. And the funny thing is that this measurement of this angle tells you what the friction, this coefficient of friction is for this material. So, before we go to the next topic, I think it's important to understand why granular system behaves slightly differently than, you know, other stuff. Book Ah. Should I stand? Where should I stand? Stand here. Ah, fine. So, yes. When we talk about states of matter, what do you understand? Like, what are the states of matter? If I ask you this question, what would what will be your answer? Speak up. Somebody speak up. Okay. So, when you talk to the audience member, what is your name? Vishnu. Ah. So, Vishnu has told us that the states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. To which I ask you that, how do you define this solid as solid, liquid, and gas? You define a solid as something whose shape and size do not change with time. 
a liquid is something that can flow and a gas is something that continuously expands any any agrees with it so what state is this book in it's solid so it, shape and size should not change but you will see that this book has one property that goes against solid i can do this too so is it still a solid so i can shear it i can shear that book i can make it change its shape but it's still in a solid form you are saying it's solid most likely because each of the pages are solid and it's at this contact points that they're slipping which is what similar can happen in this grains that each of the grains are solid but since they're only held to each other by you know very weak relatively weak forces of interaction you can overcome these forces and you can change their shape and size another thing to note is that okay it's a solid it's a very weak solid now this is a ye kya hai ha green piece ha ah, this is a container of green piece now a, how are they behaving they are all sitting down on the tip now if this was a liquid what would happen if i tilted this it would immediately start try to take this flat surface but you can see here again that there is a certain amount of angle that this surface can maintain it does not need to be flat it is because again the forces are the grains are held by friction the main reason why granular systems are different from you know your standard definition of solid liquids and gas is what's holding them together in case of a solid what's holding the each atom together is the interatomic forces there is no interatomic forces here there is nothing holding the grains together it is because of gravity they are falling on each other and because of gravity friction is acting and opposing how to move yes ha ah, occur i mean are you okay 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 what again say your question okay to answer that ha ah. so what is your name ishan ishan asked that what if you know the gravity of each of the uh, piece itself is holding the thing together to which i'll say that the easiest thing to do is calculate the number what is the you can calculate so the force between any two objects is gmm by r squared where r is you know the separation m are the masses m and m are the masses and g is the constant you can calculate this number and you will find this number to be extremely small because g itself is a very weak coupling constant it, it, it is because of this that the effects of gravity are felt when you have very large masses like the planet pulling on a person or you know the sun pulling on a planet or you know when a comet is coming near a planet and it's being pulled by the planet imagine imagine that's a complete yeah But but except for the only 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 from the green thing, and there's no other foundation. Please come. So you go to vacuum. Okay, your question is what? What if in vacuum, right? And only the gravity between the P's are there. Again, this number is going to be very small, as I showed you. friction is proportional to the normal load here it is g which is the gravitational attraction which is of earth on the body this g can be substituted by whatever acceleration you calculate from this p you will find that mu does not change even the mu even if the mu does not change this g is so small that the, now the force of friction is much reduced they are going to slip more easily the amount of force you need to overcome is very small so g is no 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 g you can calculate from the masses say in vacuum you do not have earth's gravity but you only have the p's together and you can calculate that these are my two masses of p's 
what will be the force of attraction between them and you can find out that this number that you are getting is much smaller than the value of g that 9.8 meter per second square that number you get a number that's much smaller now because the acceleration is much smaller the normal forces which is mg is going to be much smaller as well so force of friction is mu mg if mg reduces force of friction will also go down so in vacuum if the earth's gravity becomes you know very weak or if you go farther from earth this can maintain this angle at that same at that place where you have less gravity it will not be able to maintain this angle it will be more flatter okay ah this will be fun so another effect of friction is this capstan effect now if you have seen if you have been on a boat ride you will have seen that once you are down or to get down the person will tie the boat around a pole it's not the knotting that's very important he does not make a very tight knot but he does one thing that he wraps the rope around the pole a certain amount of times now what this is what this is doing is the more you wrap around the pole the more area comes into contact because the more area comes into contact this the force of friction goes up i can so there is a mathematical you can mathematically calculate how by how much the force is going up but the idea is that it goes up very fast exponentially and to show that to you we have another demo Ah, so, how much do you think this weighs? Two hundred grams. A bit too heavy. I think. I know what two hundred grams is, but <laughs> okay, we'll take a good idea. But much lighter than this string, right? Okay, that's enough. Your guess, heavy enough. Uh, what do you think the weight is? Is it heavier than your phone? So more than your phone. So phones are generally one eighty grams. So here I have a metallic bolt, and I do not know its weight as now, but we'll figure that out later. But it's and is attached to this tree now if i hang this rope on this pole as you can see it just slips now the capstan effect tells me that if i wrap it around this pole the force of friction will increase exponentially let's see one roll not enough let's do two still not there but now it's going slowly now just to keep in mind this thing weighs as least what's your name no her ha huh? mahek as per mahek so this at least weighs as much as a phone if not more so this is being held by nothing <laughs> as soon as i release the tension this went out now nah. so there is nothing at the end of the other end this is just being held up by the weight of this much string and that is all because of this effect the wrapping the rope around the pole exponentially increases the frictional force other resistance and i'm pretty sure if i leave it here it will stay there is there some kind of question yeah yeah so there is one question uh it's from uh, you can you can uh, share screen again i come up what is shear force and what is shear velocity 
sheer force and sheer velocity okay this will take some demo uh keep this on so we have a question that is asking us uh, what is sheer force and sheer velocity so shearing is the act where you know you deform an object while maintaining its volume so ex extension is when you are pulling on it but shearing is you are applying force in one direction and the thing is displacing along another direction so here shearing is the shearing between layers i am applying force on the top layer and it's going to deform the pages in this row so that's shearing shearing velocity is the velocity at which you are pulling one surface over the other so here i am moving at a certain speed this is its shear velocity if i move with more speed it's going to at a different shear velocity i hope that answer is uh, shuman's question ha ah, so this is again this will come from the calculation what's happening is say you have a turn over some angle and you have tension on the rope so what's happening is that because of this coupling with the surface the tension is acting through the surface whatever your force is and each bit of the tension whatever tension is is going to create some resistance to resistance along the rope which is the friction so the more difference in tension you have the more frictional force is you are going to create and that's yeah. going to be modulated over you know how many times this has turned over the pole which is why as you saw there that the first two turns did not do anything but as soon as i put the third turn in it stuck so, it, so as i wind it more of the rope comes into contact which means there's more you know friction force that's being generated which is now holding this up that's how it is huh no so the normal forces at any point again the calculation i cannot show you at this point but the idea is this you have say here some tension and at this point you have some other tension this tension is now acting on the surface at some angle so some of it is coming in and some of it is here is you have to draw the diagram and then you will find out that thing yes Ah, huh? this one we can try. No, not me. It's a known problem. It's a known equation. The logic is this. Uh, again, you put the tension here, and you say that okay, at some angle d theta, there are some other tension. Ah, huh? so the component, if you write it out properly, you will find that it gives you this exponential increase. Yes. yes so moment of so repeat the question okay wait. so your question is that is there some relation between moment of inertia and friction so moment of inertia i think you are just saying just inertia not moment of inertia moment of inertia is the uh, so in uh, physics terms or mathematics terms, moments are you know whatever term you have into some distance that is a moment so just inertia so inertia is a measure of you know the mass of the object so the heavier the mass is the more inertia it has the heavier object moving will need more sorry heavier object moving will need more resistance to stop it that is the part where inertia comes in but friction is saying something else it's saying that you know f is proportional to mu weight this mu is different when it's in stationary than it's in motion so if i were to measure if i wanted to measure that using my demos i'd have to measure how fast the object is accelerating once it starts to slip now if it was just inertia it would have accelerated with gravitational attraction the acceleration due to gravity but if we measure it on our system because of friction it will be reduced by some amount so friction is different from inertia but both of them depend on the mass 
I think that's where uh, the question comes to. Ah, even more fun. So, you re I showed you a sand pile. And I showed you that you can maintain its shape. Many of you might have seen this uh, sand cloth. And it's always, and they set it to a certain time and said, okay, this sand clock works for so many minutes. Now, here's a question I'll ask you before showing all this to you. If this was made with water and not sand, would it still work? <laughs> I can always make, so uh, Ishan says that if I were to make it with water, I need to put more water in. Well, I can always make the hole very small. So, it less water goes out. But there is another problem, which you may have seen, that sometimes, have you ever poked a hole in a water bottle? I take a pin out of us. Better to do it anyway. We are going to sacrifice one bottle in the name of science. I think that's okay. I need somewhere to collect the water. Hmm? There are put away. Put away. Actually, no, do it here. And bottle the book. No, no, no. How are you doing? Guys, we can't see anything. No, no, I need to Safety pin. Ah, good. What is your name? Amak. Huh? Amak. Thank you. Uh, the audience has again saved us. Ah, some kind of compass. Ah, that will do. Ah, this is. So, here's the point. Uh, this is not good. One moment. Ah. ah, here we go. So, as the pressure goes down, please stop the, the screen water share, otherwise, down, audience can't. Ah, okay, you see that's the good. distance over which this water is falling will slowly come down. I think we'll have to wait a bit. Ah, so now it's falling in that container. After some time, it will fall, fall on the first container. Okay. Ah, okay, this is going to be slow. I can wait. But here, you re what is happening is the pressure at the nozzle is dependent on how much material I have. Because in a fluid, you know, pressure is proportional to the height of the fluid. So as I reduce the height of the fluid, the pressure will go down and the flow rate goes down. That means that when you have very little water left, if you were to put it in this, the last drop will take a long time to come out. Which means you cannot calibrate it. it will, it's not a smooth flow. It's a time dependent flow. And it's already starting to reduce. Whee. Am I holding it at the correct height?
हाँ फाइव हाँ सो एज यू कैन सी ऑलरेडी दीड इज गोइंग डाउन बट यू कैनॉट बिल्ड अ हैंड क्लॉक ऑन दैट प्रिंसिपल बिकॉज एक द लास्ट ड्रॉप विल टेक इनफाइनाइटली लॉन्ग टू कम आउट so now you build a sand clock with as you said sand i will need another container so now you can see that even though when the sand becomes very small the level becomes very small the flow re remains more or less constant it is this behavior that allows you to build sand clock now you want to keep the sand continuously moving so based on that you design the structure you give it a conical angle that's slightly more than its frictional angle so that means it can't hold on any more and because it can't hold, and then as they are continuously slipping they will keep slipping till they run out and they will always be at a fixed rate that means that this but what if the angle is smaller what if the size of the particles are different so this leads us to jamming so jamming is the state in which you know these particles are no longer able to flow that the frictional contact keep them stable so that all i need to do for that is to change the grain size so this is some kind of clay sand is the size are 500 microns to 1 mm i am going to Say that okay. Give me something that's around two millimeter millimeters big, made of nearly the same material. Hello. <laughs> and nothing so what's happening here is that these particles are just big enough that and th they cannot come down this orifice anymore even though each particle is much smaller than this orifice they are they are holding on to each other by friction and because they are holding on to each other they can no longer flow and this state is known as a jam state now jam states are a feature of what kind of contacts have been formed at the edge the orifice which means that if you can disturb the contacts you can break a jam state which means if i tap this hard enough you i can break the jam sometimes i get big flow sometimes i get small flow so this is an active area of research because the less energy you need to break a jam or the more control you have over the jam you can control how many particles are coming out and over how much time this is extremely important in say industries like the pharmaceutical industry you want only a certain number of pills to come out to the funnel at any fixed point of time so you they understand that we need to break the jam but we need to break it just enough so that only a few particles the number of particles i want to come out so there are this is an active area of research and jamming is a phenomena that people study in addition jamming or the frictional coupling between grains and the surfaces oh where did i put the pointer no here the coupling between the material wall and the grain is leads to another important phenomena known as uh, 
क्लिक कीजिए एक बार स्लाइड के ऊपर नो नो स्लाइड में क्लिक कीजिए सॉरी नोन एज दी जैन सन एफ एज आई पॉइंटेड यू टू आउट टू यू दट इफ यू मेक अ टावर ऑफ वाटर टॉल the pressure at the lowest stage is going to increase as per the height of the tower this is for this reason when you have dam that they are made thinner at the top and thicker at the edge at the bottom because the pressure at the bottom is going to be much higher however when you are storing grains in say silos you will find that silos are made out of very thin sheets of metal and they are made straight up the thickness does not change which means that the pressure cannot be you know continuously increasing or as you know the base of the silo would just explode what's happening here is that if you have a cylindrical container like this and you have granular material inside it the weight of the granular the grains at any height is going to couple to the walls via friction which means instead of all the weight or the pressure of the weight going straight down to the ground through the material is going to go to the walls itself so the pressure at any point does not instead of you know growing linearly which is the thinner curve it will saturate to a certain value this is the reason why you can make silos very thin and very tall the weight is going to the walls of the silo which is going through the legs into the ground and not at the base of the silo so this is known as jansen's effect now i'll share with you a couple of experiments from our lab so this work is done by my senior somenda in with my with our professor shankar ghosh and the questions they ask is that you have two surfaces interacting with each other and you know that the friction depends on the type of surfaces that you are working with can we somehow control the friction this new factor that i have can i somehow change it okay now if we try to change it it might become noisy it might not lead to one value there might be problem can i also control how noisy this changes say that so the question you can ask is that to walk on this surface is this is this slippery and i need to put this much weight can i change how slippery this surface is or how slippery i feel it is now if i try to do that there is going to be some problems or noise in my this interaction can i also control the amount of noise there is the third question is can i do all this you know changing the friction or changing the noise on the friction without you know say in this case taking off the shoe and changing the surface of the shoe so the answer so to come to this answer this problem we they looked at this problem from another angle which is driving uphill or downhill okay, when you have traffic if it is if it was just one empty uphill or downhill road you could accelerate continuously and just go up but if you are to drive in traffic you need to maintain your vehicle at a certain speed so how do you do that while you are driving you change how much pressure you are putting on the clutch so what does that do that basically changes the coupling between the gearbox and the engine sometimes more power is going through sometimes less power is going through and you are controlling this by controlling the clutch now the problem or the effect of this kind of coupling or the changing this coupling is that this is going to lead to a lot of wear and tear in your clutch which is why you often need to service your clutches from clutch from time to time the question is can i maintain contact but still and change the you know the frictional coupling and the answer is yes instead of so what do you have in this clutch box you have one axle connected to a disc another disc connected to another axle there is a sinking instrument that works in the same manner known as a rheometer it is used to measure friction between surfaces so you have one axle which attached to some object another object attached to another axle and you move one axle at a certain speed omega and you measure okay how much force is and i am feeling and how fast is the other axle moving you can do this and this can be done very accurately what showman and the professor found out was that 
if you instead of using two hard surfaces if you use one hard and one soft deformable surface you can change the coupling between these two surfaces by controlling the number of balls small spherical balls you put in between them so if you increase the number of balls friction will slowly go down but the noise on this coupling that sometimes you are getting the average frictional value goes down but sometimes you get a lot of slip sometimes you get less slip so the noise on this coupling that can also be modulated the important point is all you need to do is to insert balls into this problem you do not need to doctor the surface in any way you do not need to change the surface just by controlling the number of balls it is basically that i have say balls of this size between my palm and by changing the number of balls is changing the frictional coupling between my two palms it here is this possible because one of the surfaces is you know deformable and soft if it was too hard piece of metal this would not have worked ha see you are working with two materials their friction is whatever friction is between the two surfaces their question was can i change this friction between these two surfaces not by you know changing the surfaces themselves but ah that reduces friction the question is not reducing the question is not to only reduce friction the question is this red point this blue dots are you know the average value these red dots are like multiple experiments giving multiple values because this is a noisy system it's not perfect ha huh. so the their question was one step further this noise i am getting can i tune that as well hmm hmm ha huh. so again this is another method i think some kind of magnetic clutches like this exist Uh, in engineering in engineering the world where you know by changing the amount of current you are feeding into the clutch system you are changing how strong the electromagnets are and how well they are grabbing onto the circuit yes that's one way non contact forces here the question was can i do it you know you contact mechanics but in a different manner that would not lead to that much of wear and tear the magnet another problem would be that if you wanted to use magnets you would have to keep control over your current and all that which would mean a lot more electronics and you know power consumption this is a, this is a much simpler procedure of doing so their main aim was to control the noise can you tune the noise is there does it behave in a systematic manner can you figure out why it behaves like this things like that i am only sharing a small part of their result with you because i did not work on this problem directly but they found out that yes you can re you can change the friction between the two surfaces by you know changing the number of you know balls you put in between them this will only work if the surfaces are soft if they are hard it won't work and you can also control the amount of noise you have in this coupling hmm ah if they are hard ha huh? okay the question uh, asked was that why do the surfaces need to be soft now pure rolling or the act of rolling what it does is the top of the wheel will move with the maximum velocity the lower part of the wheel will stick to the ground and the center of the wheel will move with half the velocity maximum velocity here. so and is this middle velocity that we maintain is the velocity of the object now that this is rolling without slipping if it is a hard surface it is more likely to slide this condition of being stuck to at the at one end and slipping at the other that is not always fulfilled it is because of this reason you need something soft that can mold around the object and pull it while the other one sticks to the surface that is why one surface huh no i am giving in the condition necessary to get rolling without slipping ah 
Ah, you can interpret it in that way. Yes, I want a rolling motion without slipping. If I were to create only you know a hard material with you know very fixed contact points, it would slide more easily, slip very well. It would slip at both ends, but I want it to you know stick and only slip at one end. So that end I make it, make it out of soft material. Okay, and now what my experiment. So again, this uh, paper. This paper is out there. If you want to read it, you may. It was done in collaboration with my professor, with my guide, Professor Ghosh, and with a professor from the theoretical department, Professor Gupta. So, I think again in this case, it will be better if I give you pictures. Toothpick ka dabba kida gaya? Ah, here. ब्लू टेप के दर इलेक्ट्रिकल टेप आई जस्ट वॉन्ट समथिंग टू मार्क वॉन्ट टू 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 हाँ अच्छा सॉरी सो दी क्वेश्चन वी आस वॉज इंस्पायर्ड बाय दिस बॉक्स ऑफ टूथपिक और एनी बॉक्स ऑफ टूथपिक When you buy a box of toothpicks, you realize that these toothpicks are arranged in this spiral pattern. Now, these were not done, you know, are these done by hand by someone putting in toothpicks one by one to get this pattern? Most likely, no. The reason why it comes to this arrangement is because it likes to minimize potential energy, and each toothpick has a certain thickness, so they can't all get to their minimal energy. So they organize between themselves to get to this pattern. now the pattern that it has because there is a spiral nature to it or you know all all the toothpicks are pointed in a certain direction it means if i it has a certain handle like a screw a certain direction to its spiral which means that if i were to give it some kind of you know linear momentum it would convert it to a angular momentum which in the context of this toothpick means if i tap it the toothpick should all rotate in one direction this is why i wanted to mark one of them just put a thin layer of tape on this i'll reduce the number of toothpicks so it's easier to see now that should be enough top 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 anyway Now this is enough. Hmm. This small blue toothpick will now move in the direction of the spiral. It will move in one direction if I tap it. Now, hmm. wait. I need to put it somewhere where you can view it. Here. You see from the top. Hmm. You can try. Just hold and tap very. Don't tap too hard. A bit. I think. Uh, just look at how I do it. And that much. That much is enough. <clears throat> ah, there it is. you can all have a look at it but the idea was that yes it's possible that if i can you know create this kind of system i can get a directed motion or you know a current just by tapping even though you know none of the particles by themselves would do this is this interaction between particles that does it now similar to you know what we observed earlier if you have lots of granular materials acting together or lots of discrete particles it can lead to you know some kind of jamming does this system have that kind of jamming you know so the question is from a floppy state to a rigid state it means see here each of these particles are discrete to fix 
nothing is holding them to each other except for you know the amount of space they have in this so that's why you know one particle can slip with respect to each other and all that so this is a floppy state it's a very soft state is it possible to go from this to a rigid state where you know none of the two peaks are going to slip with respect to each other if one moves the other must move and they will all move at the same velocity so that's the definition of rigid is it possible to go from a floppy state to a rigid state is it possible to be a rigid state but not a jammed state is like in this concept can i put enough particles such that i can get a motion but you know all of them moving together as a rigid body but not you know stuck which is jammed so enough to speak will lead to okay oh, oh, wait no so jamming is defined by motion so that means that this objects are so stuck to each other they cannot move even though you are applying the force that they need to move rigid is when they are all moving together they cannot slip for example here the blue toothpick that you are observing it can move throughout the container it can slide with respect to other one so its position is not fixed with respect to all the other toothpick a rigid body would mean that all to all toothpick should maintain their relative positions at all points of time click kijiye ek baar ha theek hai uh so this is the one that i just showed you the first one this is try that so this is what happens when you have two toothpicks and you move them so this kind of motion exists up to two toothpicks why because these are extended objects in a container one will be always above the other which means one is going to push against the other and push it towards the direction as long as this relative order is there you will get this motion next one and what he mentioned if you have enough particles you see all of them move together it's not slipping any so this is a rigid body they cannot all points are moving it's like one single body that is moving together even though these are all discrete particles so how do we measure this and quantize this is the main question so what we can measure at any point is like with the number of particles i can measure how fast it's moving the rotational speed given at a certain you know strength of excitation which is how fast i'm tapping it at one thing and we find that this common feature comes up that it slowly increases and then falls sharply we find that the falling sharply behavior is closely related to the friction so here friction was measured by putting it another toothpick how difficult is it to put another toothpick in how much resistance is that feeling because as you have defined friction is the force that you know impedes motion that's drag so all i need to do is measure how difficult it is to put one toothpick inside the box and that gives me a measure of friction i can measure this friction you know at the center of the container or near the wall and i find both of them diverge very sharply when you are putting the last few toothpicks in at which the motion completely drops now the question the other question was that can you measure the onset of rigidity like how fast rigidity comes into the problem so rigidity as i mentioned you take any two rods in your system any two points and you measure the distance between them and this should stay constant throughout the whole experiment which means if one moves the other must move with it and it must be true for all instances of time and so i what we did was we changed the number of particles and we tracked the motion of any two rods and we defined a function that looks like this that the distance between the two are r at any point of time t and any other point of time will t plus delta t and you define this function c so this is a correlation function in physics correlation function is how we quantize whether one thing is related to the other one one thing is affecting the other that is how you do it and we are only interested in delta t forward because we are interested if this moves now 
it means does the other one move with it right now or later and we and if you find the if you plot the correlation function as defined you'll find that as you keep increasing the number of rods or the packing fraction which is the num out of this many rods you can put in your box you have put in this much if you keep plotting that number at a certain number which turns out to 0.72 which means 70% of the space is filled with rods you will find that the correlation function never dies out it is just one flat point which means what this means is that if one moves one particle moves the other particle must move at the same time and it is true for all time that is and that is how you define rigidity so yes you can measure but this objects are still moving it's not stuck it is just beyond this point that you put one more rod in that is now no longer able to move zero velocity so a rigid state is different from a jam state and we can measure how both of this come into the system and we can measure and both of these are, is because of friction as measured here yes jam can there be jam state no see rigid means that a rigid body means that the distance between all points must remain the same over time which is why you know you say that a solid object is a rigid object because none of the points are moving about so a jam state is a rigid state okay but a rigid state may not be a jam state you can be a rigid body but capable of motion but if you are jammed it means not only all points are you know the distance between all points are fixed it means you cannot move at all there will be zero velocity so one way so your ans answer to your point would be if it's a rigid body with zero velocity you may call it a jam state but a jam state is more specifically defined as a state with zero motion brought about by contact between the object so that's why you cannot say a solid body is a solid object is a jam state because it's being held by interatomic forces not by a contact with each other the individual particles are not contacting each other which is holding them together there are other forces holding them together but a solid object is a rigid object because the distances between points are not changing and with these two experiments i'll conclude hopefully we have understood that what we understand of friction we have been understanding for many thousands of years and there is and there, and how we use friction every day from you know our daily lives are being affected by it and how some experiments are being done in the laboratory now if you have any questions you can ask me or you can go for chat over uh, to we, so we already had guys here for the uh, input audiences uh, so if you uh, so arno if you just direct me if you have any questions on you uh, then i will ask that and uh, anyone here if you want to ask some question uh, then uh, after this question we will uh, switch off the uh, live streaming and we'll if satan wants to show any more experiments that's the uh, like only for uh, in person uh, audience so if you have any question ask and uh, we'll take online question sir yes ha huh. hmm so ah uh, go ahead finish the question yes yeah. hmm ah okay ah so ah uh, so the question is that uh, how good is this distinction between phases when you are dealing with you know 
a collection of solids i guess that's the question you are asking so there are more finer and finer definitions you can go to to say what a phase is so there is this field okay all of physics basically will come down to one thing that is very important which is the study of phases what do we understand by a phase is like states of matter is one way to classify phases this is based on what this is based on what the at individual atoms in the system are doing in a solid they are relatively stable they are at fixed in location with some jitteriness in liquids they are moving about but not that free and in a gas they are completely free it is on the basis of this movements that you are defining the phase the states of matter or the phases now all of physics is about you know identifying phases and identifying the correct parameter to identify to designate these phases so the problem in with when you are working in granular system is you are taking an idea that meant to you know designate what's a solid what's a liquid what's a gas and applying to something else where the same things don't hold for example in a solid you have interatomic forces holding you know the atoms together which is why it's a solid in a collection of grains there is nothing holding them together there is no force that you know if you separate a grain from another nothing brings it back so the same conditions are not met but you are still using that definition here so the, of course it's going to lead to some problem so again on the other hand granular fluid that you are asking like a granular system as i showed you in the and uh, falling out of the beaker it's flowing but it's not pressure dependent at least it seems to be not pressure dependent again because unlike a fluid where you know all the particles are constantly moving about the force of attraction between them is very small here there is no force of attraction anyway and you need and the thermal and it's flowing because of you know thermal fluctuation like have you heard of uh, kbt like boltzmann constant ha ah, boltzmann constant so boltzmann constant gives you a measure of at the atomic scale how much energy this therm temperature is providing to this molecule and in a liquid there is enough temperature that over small length scales it can just dart around in here in a granular system thermal energy is not enough to make them move you can calculate for yourself for example all you do is some energy in a granular scale compared with to say kbt so say that you are working with glass beads like this 1 mm width 1 mm wide and you so you say okay the energy in this would be something like mg into its diameter and i'll compare it to kbt this ratio is going to come of the order of 10 to the power 8 so it's a huge number to move you need a lot of energy to move you know one uh, grain this energy that you to make it flow like a fluid you're providing you're providing by you know making it cross over that frictional threshold and by their own weight they are flowing they are not flowing because of you know thermal fluctuation so you can take grains from a solid to a liquid state by changing the amount of energy you are putting on them so there is another concept called fluidized sand you, you just you can search for it so what that does is that you pump in air continuously into the granular material and it fluidizes it because you know the contacts become very lossy very slippery then it behaves more like a liquid you can put objects in it and buoyancy force will push them up or down so yes granular system what state they are in depends on what energy you are pumping into it so not that you are saying that how and how and your point was that how much i force grain my understanding of it also changes what state i am looking at so if i look at only at the grain surfaces they are solid but if i look at a bigger picture it seems to be a liquid again the idea is this yes even solid liquid gases are composed of atoms discrete particles is the energy levels that make it behave the way it is same in a granular system yes okay I just i'm i'm just interrupting you once so uh, we don't have any uh, questions from uh, you two so we'll uh, stop the live stream so before that i just want to say uh, again okay. uh, like two weeks from now uh, on september we'll again meet uh, in prithvi theater jo there uh, professor arnab bhattacharya from uh, condensed matter physics department of prfr 
he will give a talk on uh, the reinventing wheels. Okay, so something related to this thing probably. So those who are interested, please uh, join us on 3rd September. So thank you for joining for the online audience and also whoever is here in person. And we, we will continue our discussion, but uh, we are just talking our live stream. Okay. Are you ready to stop the live stream? Yes, I'll turn